Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you had a, a good lunch. Um, we are about to start with our session. Uh, but before we start with our session, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Mlungel Nsegani, um, and I will be facilitating this session together with Ryan. Um, I will handle the first part, which is 4A, and Ryan will handle the second part, which is 4B. Before we start with our um, talks, I would like to just remind you again of the housekeeping rules. So your mics will be muted and videos should also be off for the duration of the whole session. Uh, but please use the other platforms to engage. Um, make sure that you keep all the questions in the Q&A box and any general comments or links um, will be supplied in that um, session. Uh, and also, if you have a question that you would like to address to a presenter, please remember to use the at sign uh, and include the presenter's uh, name, preferably the same name. Um, and if somebody has asked a question that is similar to what you wanted to ask, please always remember to hit that thumbs up button. Uh, if there are any questions that are not attended to by the end of the discussion part of the session, um, they may be addressed uh, by the presenter typing an answer uh, in the chat box. And if that does not work, uh, they can be addressed later through email. So the session that we want to dive on into at this time talks about the management of biological invasions, um, detection, eradication, and impact reduction. Because if you remember in the previous section, we talked about the impacts of biological invasions. Now we want to move over to the side that deals with their management. In this session, we have 15 talks and seven posters. And as I've indicated, they're broken down into 4A and 4B. Um, and this session will basically cover aspects that range from detection methods when it comes to biological invasions, uh, particularly when we talk about remote sensing and molecular methods such as eDNA. We will also talk about how eradication efforts can also be guided and also the different tools that we can use for management, including things like biocontrol, uh, chemical methods, and other different methods that are out there, including risk analysis. Now, we will also get an insight in the role that is played by national parks in the management of biological invasions. And also a presentation that is worth highlighting is one that shall touch on a very good story about progress towards eradicating one taxa that I think everybody will be excited to hear about. Now, before we actually go into these presentations, we will start the session with a dedication to Prof. Olaf Vail, um, who was a giant in the biological invasions community and who will always live on in our hearts and memories uh, to come. So, we want to start off the session with that dedication. And once we are done with that, we will then move over to the presentations. Um, thank you very much.
Hi all, today we will be considering detecting aliens from space. My name is Jitain Singh and I've been supervised by Dr. Siobhan Reynolds, Professor Marcus Byrne and Professor Benjamin Rossman from the University of the Witwatersrand. In this talk, I will be considering uh, Earth observation products that were derived from this research paper uh, recently published in, a remote, in remote sensing. And this research paper can be accessed using this QR code or this bit.ly link. Once I have taken you through the Earth observation products that have been derived, I will take you through a demo on how you can access these products for your own study area. And lastly, I will consider some challenges that we were presented during this work and how we've overcome them. And lastly, the challenges that still remain. And um, for the demo, you can access it at this link here. So just to give you an introduction to the different uh, or the reasons why we would need um, a monitoring system for uh, water hyacinth in this case or any other aquatic macrophytes. Um, so when it comes to invasive plant management, there are five questions that we may be interested in answering. And this is which species is where and when might the species be there? And perhaps at some point soon, we will also be able to tell why the species is there and where next. So this is dealing with the drivers and the risks. The next thing I will do is consider the different uh, earth observation products that uh, came out of the research paper. So um, we have two columns here. The, the column on the left is looking at local scale um, monitoring and the second uh, is your national scale monitoring. And in this case, we're considering South Africa. On the left hand side, um, we have three different products. So the water product, the aquatic vegetation and water hyacinth. Um, so for each of these products, we could either derive the extent or dyna dynamics. So for water and aquatic vegetation, we are able to generate um, the extent and dynamics on a local scale and on a national scale. However, for water hyacinth, we can only derive the extent um, on a local scale and on a national scale, we are not yet able to derive the dynamics. Um, so uh, the repeated extent, in other words. The image on the top is showing you um, an area uh, over Artibiaspur Dam and the detected water output. So this would be the extent. The second image at the bottom is showing you the aquatic vegetation extent and can be seen uh, in bright green. The next thing that I would do is take you through a demo. So as I said, if you visit the link that was on the previous slide, it would take you to this page. And on this page, you will gain access to this repository with six scripts. Each of these scripts accomplish a different uh, output mentioned in the, in the previous table. So, I will be taking you through this example of aquatic vegetation monitoring. Um, so when you click on, on the link and you click on this script, and then you need to press run. And when you click run, this um, user interface is gonna pop up on the right hand side. And the code for this app can be found in here. Um, at this stage, you can zoom into a water body of interest. I'm just going to select how to be put there. I'm going to show an area of interest around this water body. And these next three parameters are hyperparameters. And so, for instance, um, you can set the start and end date of your uh, period of interest. So that the period uh, through which you want to detect aquatic vegetation and water. And then this parameter on the left controls 
how frequently do you want to detect water? And there are obvious consequences of this. Um, and you can check out more details in the research, research paper for this. Um, so I'm just going to leave the default parameters and I'm going to select Landsat 8. And this is going to detect the water and aquatic vegetation at a 30 meter spatial resolution. The Sentinel-2 uh, option detects water and aquatic vegetation at a 10 meter spatial scale. Um, so as you can see in the layers tab, there's these bars which show that the layers are loading. And as these layers load, we'll be able to examine them. And so we can uh, quickly see that this green areas here, which correspond to aquatic vegetation have been detected by the algorithm. And so that's this light green. Um, for this area here at the top, which uh, is not being detected, that's because the water layer um, is inaccurate. And so there are ways around this for which we can chat about in the Q&A session, or if you insisted, we could speak after um, through an email or other communication. Um, so to look at some of the outputs that we get, So there are three outputs. The first output shows you the aquatic vegetation cover over time. And so the aquatic vegetation dynamics. The second chart shows you the NDVI mean for these corresponding points. And this um, is linked to uh, vegetation health. The last chart here shows you the surface water dynamics. Um, and so, um, the reason for this depth appearance is because of that um, window size parameter, which we left at four. And um, so that implies that uh, we use the same water extent for every four months. And so that's why we end up with this depth like appearance. Um, what's also interesting is that, for instance, we could click on a particular point of interest or date rather, and this is going to bring up the corresponding images for that date. So we just need to wait a short while for it to load. And as you can see, the aquatic vegetation has been detected and the water. And so if you wanted to just quickly check how accurate this is, um, this should give you some sort of an idea. And so it does seem quite accurate. Um, what's also cool is that you could click on this button and it will open the chart in, um, in a new tab. And from here, you have the option to download this data as a CSV file, or you can download this chart as an image to, to be used in any presentation. Um, so with this out of the way, the next thing I will consider uh, is the challenges. And so the first two challenges here refer to challenges that we have faced and um, to, to some degree we have found solutions to. Um, so the first point here is referring to spatial temporal resolution. Um, so when it comes to detecting aquatic invasive plants, we might be interested in a high resolution so to be able to detect the smaller mass of uh, aquatic vegetation and then a high temporal resolution to enable us to detect these uh, these maps sooner than later and increase the, the chance of us uh, successfully managing these invasive plants. And so the way we've uh, gotten around to, to solve this is by combining two different satellites, uh, so data from Sentinel and Landsat. The second point here is when we are dealing with such large amounts of data, um, it becomes a difficult thing to manipulate or process this data. And for this, we use a cloud computing uh, platform that's freely available to researchers called Google Earth Engine. The last two or last three points rather deal with uh, uh, challenges that still remain. So the third point is uh, spatial temporal transferability. Um, so this is the ability to use our methods for different areas. Um, and 
there needs to be more research in this area. Um, and as I mentioned previously, um, we might be interested in developing spatially explicit risk assessments uh, using uh, this uh, comprehensive distribution. And lastly, and probably the most important point is that we need more in situ data that uh, perhaps of higher quality than what we currently have available in, for instance, Chiba. Thank you for your time and attention. Greetings, everyone. I am Nonga Zimulo Mtitimba, and I'll be presenting my master's project titled Detecting Alien Freshwater Crayfishes Using eDNA in South Africa. There are currently four um, alien species in South Africa, the crayfish, and they're namely smooth marin, the common yabi, the red hawk crayfish, and the red swamp. All these have been introduced from Europe and America via aquaculture, pet trade, and for biological control purposes. And from these four, only two have established populations in the wild, which is the Cherub quadricarnatus and the Procamaras clarkin. And the rest of and the two are in um, captive facilities such as your aquaculture. A uh, majority of the surveillance methods for crayfishes have been based on traditional sampling, um, that is your beta traps and electrofishing. However, due to the barring behavior of the crayfishes, these methods often lead to a false negative results. That is, species are present but simply not detected in majority of the times. However, um, the eDNA has been proven to be effective um, in allowing early detection and also effective management of alien species, particularly the alien freshwater, um, the alien freshwater crayfish species. This is also Sadbi's mandate, which is based on the number Act 10 of 2004, which aims to develop improved methods that will enable early detections for effective management of alien species in the country. The first aim of this study is to assess whether eDNA can be used as a reliable method to detect the presence of alien species in freshwater systems. Now, this will be achieved by comparing the eDNA with the traditional um, baited traps. And the second aim is to identify and record the co-invading ectoparasites on the Procamerus clarkey. This will be achieved by identifying these parasites using DNA barcoding, as parasites are often um, difficult to identify morphologically. Now, um, only um, Cherubs quadricarinatus ectoparasites have been recorded in the country. So this is the first um, for parasites to be recorded on the red swamp, which is the Procamerus clarkey. Now, these are my study sites, and the mimosa dam highlighted in red, it's basically a newly infested area um, in free state, which is invaded by the Procamerus clacky, which clearly shows that the species is expanding its range in the country. Now, the sampling method for the first aim is that I will I start off by firstly sampling eDNA, water samples for eDNA. So I scoop 750 surface water. I then filter um, it uh, through a cellulose nitrate membrane using a vacuum pump. And then these membranes are then uh, preserved in ethanol and stored under dark conditions at negative 20 Celsius degrees to minimize DNA degradation. Then later, I then employ the baited traps, which I set overnight and check them the next morning. The filter membranes for eDNA are directly subjected to DNA extraction using the DNEZ blood and tissue kit following the manufacturer's um, instruction. And then for amplification of the DNA, I employ what is called a quantitative PCR, which is qPCR. This basically uses um, species-specific primers, and it will also establish a curve where we'll get to estimate um, the, the abundance of the, our target species. Now, for the second aim, that is identifying the parasites, I then collect the, prey, the crayfishes using the beta traps, and then these crayfishes are then examined under a microscope to check if there are any parasites. In, and if there are any, the parasites are then preserved in ethanol, um, where they will be later um, barcoded for DNA. Now, one of the things that stood out was that two of these look quite different. These are same species, but from different locations. So we'll also barcode to check if there's any species in that orchid, or if these two species are basically from different exact locations where they've been um, introduced. 
And then um, DNA will be amplified using the universal primer and then will also employ um, the gel electrophoresis just to check the DNA bands. Currently, I'm waiting for sequences for the tissue samples for the Cherox kinase, Cherox quadricarinatus, and the Clarke, as well as the ectoparasites, which is the temnocephalins. And then I'm also currently busy with the qPCR, and I'm also currently photographing the specimens. I'd like to thank these following institutes, which made it possible for my research, um, funding, and support. Thank you. It's better be safe than sorry. Isn't this the same? And we all know that when talking about invasive species, it's better to nip it in the bud. But to do that, to nip aliens in the bud, we need to track their arrival, track their impact and spread. And that can be achieved by establishing long-term surveillance programs. That is why we tested the method for monitoring the introduction of marine fowling species in marinas, ports, and other vulnerable areas. Our trials were set in four different sites from Saldanha Bay to Durban. Why bother? Well, 42% of the marine invasive species in South Africa are fallen. And those organisms can offer great impact to economy by compromising marine infrastructure, including pipes, and aquaculture facilities, increasing the maintenance costs. So in these pictures from a mussel farm in Saldanha Bay, it's possible to see the rafts having fold and a variety of fowling growing on the mussel ropes. These species are also a problem for shipping companies and boat owners that need to spend quite a lot of money to scrap them out of hooks because among other issues, a heavily fold hull makes a vessel to sail slower and spend more fuel. Additionally, alien fallen organisms can harm native species and alter benthic communities, as happened with the introduction of the Mediterranean mussel in South Africa. Okay, but what about the method we developed? Well, it's basically a row with two white PVC plates attached to it, more or less like this plate you can see here. It's actually exactly one of these. And this hole were drilled to pass the hole through. So the first plate is set at one meter depth and the bottom plate at two meter depth. We use the fishing weight to stabilize the race. The arrays can be tied to floats, aquaculture rafts, and jetties. And as you can see in this image, we use two different types of array. So we have open and caged plates. Why? Why to have two different types of array? Well, as you can see in these graphs, uh, the composition of species in both arrays is uh, represented, so caged, are represented by black squares and open represented by gray circles. Each graph is for one of the study sites. And as you can see, the species composition differ between array type in all of them, showing that they detect different species. So the plates are dropped in the water and removed after four months. When taking them from water, it's time to take pictures for species identification and quantification. And new or uncertain species can be collected for lab analysis. So in this image now, you can have an idea of how the plates were when we removed them from water after four months. The manufacture of each caged array costs 50 ram, while each open array costs 30 ram. We also tested the number of arrays to be deployed, and for the trials, five arrays of each type were sufficient. So if we consider this setting, five arrays of each type, the monitoring setup costs 400 grams per site. It's pretty good, isn't it? So after all, the standard method we are suggesting here, it's effective, it's simple, and it's low cost 
favoring its long-term application and broad use, which would enable spatial and temporal comparisons. So let's drop some plates. Hello everyone, my name is David Kinsler and I'm going to be presenting on using remote sensing as a monitoring tool for water hyacinth on Hartebius Port Dam. This is part of our master's thesis and I'm supervised by Ms. Gillian McGregor from the Geography Department and Prof. Martin Hill and Prof. Judy Kutsia from the Centre for Biological Control. Just a bit of context for the work that I'm doing. So water hyacinth has been a major problem on Hartebius Port Dam for many years. But since the release of Megametis scutellaris, the biological control agent for water hyacinth, since 2018, uh, the water hyacinth populations have collapsed quite significantly. And so over the course of a couple months, the cover went from 40% down to less than 10%. And this kind of uh, change needs quantification. As the old cliche goes, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So I understand not everyone might be familiar with remote sensing and essentially what remote sensing does is it collects information about the Earth's surface from a distance and that is typically from satellites or aircraft and more and more increasingly from drones as well. Um, a typical application uh, of remote sensing in my field would be change detection. So you have your before image and your after image and you quantify some sort of change that has taken place in the landscape. The implicit assumption with this kind of analysis is that the landscape is relatively static, or at least that any single snapshot in time is a useful comparison to another moment in time. This assumption doesn't work so well when what you're trying to study is so dynamically changing all the time. And so these two images of how to be split down are 24 hours apart, and you can see how quickly the water house and distribution changes over that period. And in the left image, the water hyacinth covers 43% of the dam, and then the next day it only covers 29%. And so trying to measure this kind of uh, phenomena can be quite challenging. And the water hyacinth even changes on a minute by minute basis. And so these two images at the bottom are about 45 minutes apart, and you can already see how quickly the distribution of the mat has changed. And so to conceptualize this problem, you might take two readings in time, but those readings don't actually represent what's happening on the ground. And so you might miss the actual trend that's going on or small scale changes. So for example, if the water hyacinth has been recently sprayed, those changes happen over a period of days and weeks, not months or years, which is a typical time span over which uh, remote sensing data are analyzed. So in response to this, uh, the field is going through what some authors are calling a paradigm shift, where typically an endpoint approach to remote sensing is being replaced with a dense time series analysis and monitoring. And this is largely thanks to two reasons. First one being more open source data available. So more satellites on our orbiting the Earth, we're getting more data in every day and cloud computing resources as well. Previously, it was just impractical to analyze uh, more than a dozen or so images. And now that uh, barrier has, has fallen away. And so we can compute and analyze a lot more data than we previously were able to. So the aim of my research was to take these developments and, and changing um, methods in the remote sensing field and create a tool for how to best put them. Um, I wanted it to be capable of retrospective analysis as well as near real-time monitoring to give up-to-date information of the situation on the dam. Um, another requirement was that it was scalable and reproducible. So whilst I'm focusing on how to press put dam, it can be also applied to other areas. And importantly, it needs to be accurate and robust. So the first step is to create a detection uh, algorithm that can accurately detect macrophytes as well as algae on the dam. And how this works is it takes a satellite image, in this case a Sentinel-2 image, and it masks uh, the boundary of the dam to that image, as you can see in image number two. And this is dynamic, so it changes uh, according to the dam level. 
In picture three, I apply an index. And what an index does is it is a mathematical uh, formula which amplifies certain spectral properties um, of the image. And this helps us detect uh, different uh, phenomena in the image. In this case, this index is optimized towards detecting water. And that allows the algorithm to then remove water from the image. In step four, I then apply my own index um, to the image, which is optimized for detecting uh, uh, macrophytes, um, but not algae. And so that helps me separate uh, between the two classes, which as you can see in picture three, are not that well separated. And then in picture five, uh, the final output is an image which uh, gives a percentage cover of, of the three different classes. Now, the real strength of an algorithm like this is when you apply it in a cloud computing environment. And so I use Google Earth Engine, which is a, a open source service provided by Google, which allows researchers to analyze um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of, of images in a data set and to apply your methodology to those images and then get an output um, at the end of it. And the backbone of, of my uh, analysis uses Sentinel-2 images, which give us near global coverage um, every five days or less and is at a 10 meter resolution, which is a moderate resolution by remote sensing standards. And so if I apply this methodology to how to best put dam, we then get a result like this, where it gives us a detailed time series of the water house and dynamic um, over the last five, six years. And I just want to point out quickly here, um, over the summer period of 2019, 2020, and 2020 and 2021, uh, there were sharp declines in water hyacinth growth. And this is atypical, as you, as you would usually expect, um, high rates of growth over the summer period. Because this model is easily reproducible and can be applied in other areas, um, I can conduct the same analysis uh, on, on other dams. And so this is Ruderplot Dam, uh, for example, which has had a relatively low water hyacinth level until 2020, where it uh, got out of hand and has since come under control again since the introduction of Megamelis on the dam. Um, Bosport is another dam um, in the area that we're also analyzing. Now, one of the problems with using optical data is that most of the images that we analyze have some level of clouds in them. And so you end up having to throw away uh, many of the images that you could otherwise use. And this is particularly uh, problematic over the summer period um, in the half out where there are a lot of thunderstorms and a lot of cloud cover. And so this last summer period over Heart of Bestport Dam, over the period of uh, three months, we only had four usable images. And within that three month period, there was six, seven weeks of no images at all. And so to use that as a monitoring tool um, becomes impractical because we, we're not getting up to date uh, data. And so in response to that, um, we can supplement this time series with other data sources, particularly radar data as radar data um, doesn't suffer from cloud cover and it can detect uh, water hyacinth uh, straight through clouds. And just briefly how this works is that um, water and water hyacinth uh, reflect radar waves uh, differently. And so with water, um, it reflects most of the radar waves away, uh, which is called specular reflection, whereas water hyacinth uh, has diffuse reflection. And so the waves come in and bounce around on the plant and some of that data are returned back to the satellite. Also, the polarization can change depending on how it interacts with uh, objects on the surface. And so we can use all that information to create uh, radar images that detect water hyacinth um, on the dam. And what that lets us do is take an image like this where there are uh, large gaps in the time series and fill those gaps with uh, radar data, giving us a more detailed and more up-to-date uh, monitoring tool. Using uh, these methodologies has enabled us to create uh, reports um, for, for various dams and 
enables us to monitor the situation on these dams uh, on a week by week basis. So into the future, because these methods are scalable, there's potential for a national and even regional monitoring applications. And so, as I've said before, our focus on Hartebeest Port Dam, but this is certainly not just limited to Hartebeest Port Dam. Um, there's a lot of potential for collaboration. I'm not the only researcher working on this kind of stuff. Uh, Jutin Singh, who's also presenting in this conference, um, has done some outstanding work as well in this field. And this can also go beyond water hyacinth and macrophytes. It, there's a lot of other applications that we can uh, apply cloud computing to. So for example, in the geography department, we're looking at ways to use Google Earth Engine to create detailed fire histories for, for particular areas going back all the way to the 80s. And so there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, and, and potential applications of this going forward. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Luke Janssen van Vieren, and the title of my talk today is Molecular Identification of Full Armorium Strains in a Laboratory Reed Culture. My supervisors are Dr. Nikki Crew, Prof. Kirsten Kruger, and Prof. Dave Berger. So the full armyworm Spidoptera frugipoda is relatively new in Africa. It was reported in West Africa in 2016 and South Africa in 2017. On the right-hand side, you can see a map um, which was made up in 2017, which just shows the confirmed presence of the pest in the countries marked in red. This pest is indigenous to the Americas. It's a polyphagous pest, so it feeds on over 80 different crops. And the species can be subdivided into two different strains, namely the corn strain and the rice strain. It's important to note is that these strains differ in host preference and their susceptibility to chemical and biological agents. As the two strains are morphologically indistinguishable, the identification methods include molecular markers. The first marker I'll discuss is the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene or the COX gene. This is widely used in insect identification. One could say this is the standard marker. It's a mitochondrial marker and the results of using this marker would either be corn strain or rice strain. What's key to note is that Due to it being situated on the mitochondrial genome, it's subject to maternal inheritance. So it doesn't give you any information regarding the paternal line. It also does not give you any information with regards to whether it is a hybrid or not. The second marker is the TPI gene or triose phosphate isomerase gene. This marker is a nuclear marker that I've predominantly observed in full armyrum population genetic studies, uh, where it is mainly used by researchers such as Nagoshi. It is not widely used, but has been referred to as being potentially more reliable or accurate as compared to the COX-1 gene due to, link, due to it linking more consistently with observed host preference. The result possibilities are corn strain, rice strain, or hybrid. Um, the key things to note about this marker is that it's based on a sex-linked chromosome, meaning that there are two copies in the male and only one in female. Therefore, only male specimens will display hybridization. In my MSc studies, I read a full armyrum culture, not exactly to look into full armyrum strain identities, but more to conduct various abibri assays. I encountered a large number of issues, more than the common issues of fighting off mites and trying to mitigate caterpillars eating one another. I struggled with regards to the strain identity of the culture. On the right-hand side are my results for sequencing a number of full armyrum specimens collected from the colonies. There were two independent colonies, the first having died off after hard lockdown last year. The specimens were taken over multiple generations. So first, I want to just speak about the COX-1 strain identities that I got. Um, so sequencing the COX-1 gene, strain identities for the first two specimens were corn and the following samples rice. I want to conclude that I was unlucky in sampling a minority strain in the colony and that majority was an actual fact rice strain, the corn strain being subsequently lost um, in the colony over multiple generations. The second colony, all specimens were corn strain for this marker. But when sequencing the TPI marker as well, one gets a fuller picture of what is going on genetically in this culture. The first two specimens were noted to be hybrids, and the following are corn strain in colony one. The discordance between the markers further showing hybridization in the colony's ancestry. The second colony, one can see this more evidently as specimens were only taken from the first two generations, and hybridization between the strains being captured early on in this colony. What's important to note is that the data is relevant for repeatability of experiments. The two strains differ significantly with regards to important nuclear-based genes such as digestion and detoxification genes. 
So only screening one of the markers, namely the COX-1, for example, could lead to one linking one's research to potentially the wrong strain or making the wrong predictions regarding the potential outcome of certain experiments. It's also good to note that hybridization between the strains is something that has been discovered many, many years back and is a norm. What I propose as a way forward when working with laboratory red cultures is first to use both markers when screening. Both markers when used together give more accurate results regarding the strain identity. And secondly, screening over multiple generations. Screening over a few samples over one generation may lead to one missing key specimens of the opposite strain that could lead to further generations being hybrid specimens. And lastly, this one is a bit easier said than done, but to further investigate the development of new reliable nuclear markers. As I mentioned, there are key detoxification genes that differ between the strains. This may serve as a means to more clearly define if a colony is rice strain or corn strain leaning in its nuclear genome makeup. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope it all made sense and gave a bit of clarity with regards to the full RMM strains. I want to say thank you to my funding body, the CSIR, and my research group, the MPPI group, the University of Pretoria, that I was privileged to be a part of. Hi, everyone. I am Kele Tsongwilwe, and I'll be presenting my work on the repeatable methods of classification for alien and native vegetation in the montane grasslands. South Africa is a water scarce country, making it the 30th driest country. Areas which receive high rainfall are often and are found in high lying areas are often termed strategic water source areas. These areas contribute largely to the country's water security. Unfortunately, land cover change poses as one of the biggest threats to these areas. And in this case, it happens in the form of invasive alien plants. Our study area comprises of the Maripscop Nature Reserve, Maripscop State Forest, and the Blader River Canyon Nature Reserve in Limpumalanga and Limpopo. These areas are well renowned for their biodiversity and tourism and form part of the Mpumalanga Drakensberg SWSA. GIS and remote sensing are great tools which offer a cost-effective manner and their application can be used for land cover mapping. This is ensured by obtaining data in repeatable methods. And algorithms can be trained for land covers to produce spectral signatures, which can be identified by the sensor and be used for land cover mapping. For field work, prior field work, we created points for each land cover class while using high resolution multispectral images as background to identify the predetermined land cover classes. A, a total of 3,510 classes were created in QGIS. During field work, QField app, which was downloaded in my phone, was synced with my QGIS on my PC to load the points in my cell phone so that we can track these different land cover points as we go on point by point for verification purposes. In Google Earth Engine, our points were loaded, which represented 11 land cover trusses. We used Sentinel-2 imagery with five different indices, vegetation indices, and we added ancillary data such as elevation data, topographic data, and aspect data while applying the random forest classifier. Our land cover classes were split into training and validation data for accuracy assessment purposes. This is the map we present using free and repeatable methods with our different land cover classes and the distribution of classes according to their plateau and escarpment. From the map we just saw, we derived that there are special spatial patterns of alien and native vegetation. 
Firstly, with what loss, we realize that they actually are responsible for most of the bush encroachments in grasslands and water sources. We also noticed the common practice of forest plantations of pines and eucalypts on the escarpments, which often results in invasions of our indigenous forest. Unfortunately, poorly managed plantations often encourage invasions of alien forestation plant species to the rest of the areas. The grasslands are usually found in the plateau, which are often affected by the concentration of pine plantations too. We also have our recently cleared plantation class, which if it's cleared by fire, it, become, it often becomes a breeding ground for bracken. Finally, our imagery produced an accuracy of 76% for both alien and native vegetation. And the map we produced, we believe it could minimize the threat to water sources and biodiversity by helping monitor and manage the spread of these invasive alien plants as they take place. I thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Grant Martin from the Centre for Biological Control. Uh, and this afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about why and the merits of starting an invasive alien plant working group for Southern African mountain systems. Within my capacity at the Centre for Biological Control, I manage a programme looking for biocontrol options for northern temperate weeds. These weeds are primarily invasive in the area highlighted on the little map here by the red square. Working on these invasive species uh, have led me to see that there's actually very little collaboration uh, currently between researchers, conservation managers, uh, and government. However, I'm just a researcher working within one of these mountain systems. I do not claim to be an expert in South African uh, mountain systems nor on invasive plants for the whole of South Africa. However, I do believe there is a need uh, for a working group on mountain systems. And so back to that. Why do I think this is important? Well, firstly, our mountains are understudied. Uh, they are the least studied mountain systems in Africa. So as a researcher, I think there's massive opportunity here to really collaborate and do some incredible research into our mountain systems. Secondly, they are incredibly important to the functioning of South Africa. The Eastern Great Escarpment produces a huge amount of the water that's used by most of South Africa. They are all incredibly rich in floral and faunal uh, diversity. And they provide ecosystems, goods and services that are uh, valuable and important to millions of South Africans. Unfortunately, um, many of these mountain systems, if not all of these mountain systems, are heavily impacted by invasive alien plants. These plants are having significant effects on uh, biodiversity, on water security, uh, and general ecosystem goods and services. Uh, to the people living within these regions, uh, as well as downstream from these regions. Um, to this regard, there's also been a limited management of a lot of the species growing in uh, some of our mountain ranges, not all of them. Uh, and this is, there's, as there's been a focus on species growing in riparian areas, uh, species growing um, closer to urban centers, uh, and so a lot of areas, especially in the higher regions, uh, have been completely neglected uh, with regard to management. Uh, uh, to this regard, invasive species and mountains in general uh, in South Africa have very much been neglected uh, within the national environmental policy. Uh, the invisibility of mountain areas in this policy is probably because they cover, the mountains cover quite a small area of South Africa. Uh, and have low human population numbers, and they, therefore they have limited political importance in South Africa. 
as an initial step towards trying to get a handle on what's uh, going on in our mountain systems in South Africa, I was fortunate enough to work with a couple of invasion biologists and people who work on mountain systems who are far more knowledgeable than myself. And we had a look at what species are currently invading each of the mountain ranges around South Africa. This in itself turned out to be an interesting exercise. Just trying to delineate the various mountain ranges in South Africa came with its own pitfalls, as there seems to be no agreed upon definition of which mountain range or what depicts a mountain range within South Africa. However, we were able to select out uh, the most prevalent invasive species in each of the mountain ranges. And as can be expected, we found different species were more dominant in the different mountain ranges. Obviously, this would then mean that uh, each mountain system, as it has a different suite of uh, invasive species, requires uh, unique management strategies for those dominant invasive species in those systems. We were also able to investigate the effect of altitude on the different invasive species in each of these mountain ranges. Uh, if you looked at the graph behind, you can see there was a different suite uh, of invasives in the high areas compared to the lower regions, uh, which would once again suggest that uh, we have to look at different management approaches uh, along altitudinal gradients within our mountain systems. However, the most significant finding from this little study was probably the limitations within the data and how little we actually know about the invasive species currently invading our mountain systems. The occurrence data is often limited to access points, to roads and pathways. Uh, they don't often give a density of the invasive species. Uh, lots of invasive species are sometimes completely ignored or neglected uh, within uh, the data set. And I think therefore not having sound uh, data uh, on exactly what's going on in these systems makes it very difficult to make adequate management plans uh, that are suitable to each of the systems. The mountain ranges of South Africa often have uh, distinct environmental conditions, such as larger temperature fluctuations, higher rainfall, uh, the, and the occurrence of freezing conditions, such as snow. These features uh, are often favorable to only a certain type of invasive alien plants. Uh, for example, in the regions where I'm working, species like pyracantha and Catoniaster and rosa are only found uh, where there is over 50 days of frost or below zero temperatures. These species, therefore, are unique to environment and require unique management strategies, which aren't shared by the surrounds. So management that's being implemented in the surrounding regions is often inappropriate, and I believe that people work in different mountain ranges could be sharing their management successes that have worked in their ranges uh, into other mountain ranges. Uh, the Cape Fold Mountain has had extensive experience working with invasive alien plants compared to a lot of the other mountain ranges in South Africa. And I believe lessons could be learned between mountain ranges. All in all, um, my work over the last few years um, and some of the papers I've been working on of late has highlighted uh, a number of questions of which I don't believe there are answers for in South Africa. Um, that is sort of pushed me down the road to, to tr thinking about uh, a mountains invasive alien plant working group um, to try and answer some of these questions. Uh, questions regarding drivers of invasion, uh, management of invasion, pathways of invasion, uh, and how we can get on top of this. And so what I effectively I'm proposing today, and I've potentially gone about it a long way, is just I'd like to get in contact with people who think this might be a good idea or who might be willing to uh, partake in this initiative and see if we can uh, come to some uh, conclusions or some some sort of a framework. This is a framework I've uh, effectively stolen from the Cactus Working Group and modified to what I think we should be aiming for uh, if we were to develop a mountain uh, working group for 
uh, invasive alien plants uh, for mountain systems. Unfortunately, I think invasive alien plants are going to continue to spread and expand within our mountain systems. Uh, and more species will continue to be introduced and discovered. Uh, invasive grasses are only just starting to appear and are gonna have huge impacts in our mountain systems. Um, these invasions are probably being driven by climate change and land degradation, both of which are really prevalent and not gonna go away anytime soon. And so establishing um, research protocols and groups and um, systems which can allow us to um, untangle the drivers of invasive alien species uh, in our mountain system and look at management options which are appropriate, uh, I think is essential. And this kind of information hopefully will feed policy, uh, national policy that can then be used to protect our mountain systems. Uh, I also don't believe we're alone in this. I think, uh, for example, globally, there exists a mountain invasion research network. Uh, and I think we should be aligning within, within their long-term monitoring goals and their methods for managing invasive species uh, in our mountain systems. I also don't feel like uh, we should be working as islands. I think we need to be working together. And that's why I want to work as Southern Africa to work with Lesotho, especially Lesotho, because it's really a mountain kingdom within South Africa that we can't, cannot ignore. Uh, we need to work with Eswatini and Namibia, uh, as well as Zimbabwe, as they all share similar invasive species and mountain regions. And I think any information we can provide or they can provide us uh, would really be beneficial uh, to developing appropriate management strategies. Therefore, I'm hoping a working group will provide a platform that um, creates a space for researchers uh, conservationists and people from government uh, to come together to work towards uh, this growing problem of invasive alien plants within our mountain systems. Just to conclude, mountain ranges in South Africa are under massive threat from invasive alien plants. I believe conventional methods of data collection, research and management could be improved upon. Uh, and I'm hoping by starting a working group, we can increase collaboration amongst researchers and conservation managers to facilitate best management and research practices um, with the ultimate goal of reducing the spread and impacts of invasive alien plants uh, in our mountain systems. Uh, I'm really hoping to create a platform for transboundary collaboration, for transdiscipline collaboration. And I'm really encouraging anybody who is interested in this to contact me. Uh, I'm looking for ideas and suggestions uh, and really just also to thank everyone who supported me and helped me uh, with all the research and work I've been involved in over the last few years. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, very lovely talks. Now we want to um, have a few questions. Um, hopefully for each and every one of the presenters, they'll be at least able to get one question. What I want to highlight to everyone is that there are some presenters that are not present uh, today. Um, and I think that is Grant and Keleto. So I'm aware that there are some questions that were directed to them. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get the answers um, now. We might have to do it at a later stage via email. Um, and also, you know, as Grant's talk was calling for collaborations uh, and hopefully people who are interested, perhaps it would be good for you to get in touch with him via email and I think his details are included in the program. Now we want to move on to the questions, um, but before we actually have any question, what is at the top of the list was a comment from Guy Preston and I will read it. It says that, so pleased to note the dedication to Olaf, he was pivotal in the listing of invasive fish species in the alien and invasive species regulations, and particularly in debunking the shenanigans of the trout and Nile tilapia lobbyists, sorely missed. Um, and I'm sure that we all agree and share the 
same sentiments with what Guy has said. In terms of questions, we want to start off with um, a question to Jithin. Um, I am aware that some of the questions have already been answered uh, via the chat, but what I think it might be good is for us to pick some of those that you know, are key and have the presenters um, give the answers live. So the first question that I want to address to you, Jitin, is from Naweji, who has asked whether the brilliant technology that you highlighted in your presentation could be used to detect um, terrestrial weeds? And if so, are there any specific examples that you can share with us? Okay, sure. Um, thanks, Lo and Luigi. Um, so um, when it comes to detecting terrestrial plants, it's a much more difficult problem than detecting alien weeds. And um, so, yes, it is possible. There has been lots of work in the space, but it needs to scale up. So in other words, um, it's very limited to a single area or sometimes just to a particular time period. And so there needs to be lots of work to make this more uh, transferable to different times and, and different areas. And so for our work, we, we were able to do a, a South African scale water ice and distribution, which is currently the largest extent um, of, of any invasive species mapping. And so um, the challenges on achieving that for other invasive species, including terrestrial species, is the, the need for uh, high quality field data. Um, so just locality points of particular species. Um, so uh, with regards to the examples, um, there's been probably for every major uh, invasive terrestrial plant or even aquatic weed, there has been at least one paper um, trying to map them using remote sensing. And so yeah, it's, um, I have shared one on Parthenium in, in the chat, um, but if there's any particular species you're interested in, you can uh, message me and I will share something with you. Thanks. Thank you, Jethan. I think let's move on to Nongkazi. Nongkazi, uh, there was a question from Josie South uh, talking about that, will you be screening for crayfish plague? Um, and when you are comparing with baited traps, which method of baited traps are you using? And will you be comparing detection probabilities? Oh, okay. So due to time, I am only going to focus on the temnocephalans ectoparasites and not the crayfish plug. And with comparing the traditional to um, eDNA, I used the mostly used one, which is the PROMA collapsible baited traps. And with, I'm still waiting for um, the eDNA results. Unfortunately, I was only able to do it early last month. So I'm still waiting on that. But with what I picked up, um, I think with the um, traditional, it also um, depends on the, what is it, sampling effort as well. So we'll see what the results um, tell us in terms of comparison the two methods. Thanks, Nongkazi. I have a question for Taina. Uh, Taina, I actually wanted to ask you, in terms of the plates that you are using, yeah. how exactly are those plates made? I mean, they seem very cool, but I'm actually interested in how, how exactly you know, are they made? <laughs> they are a perfect, perfect uh, plate. So it's a kind of plastic. And we were careful to, um, to leave them soaking in water. And then we, we after soaking them for a while to, to release any chemicals that could uh, be a problem for the animals to settle, we also um, send them to facilitate the, um, the animals to attach to it. Thanks, Taina. <laughs> um, I want to talk, um, uh, I want to move on to the next question. And that's to Kinsler. The question is from Warren and it says, 
um, how much of this data and information is getting back to stakeholders around the dams who are concerned that biocontrol is not making much of an impact on seasonal hyacinth growth? David? Um, hello, can you see me? We can hear you, but I don't think we can yeah, see I'm, you. I'm just going to go ahead then. Um, so ahead. yes, so we do create uh, bi-monthly reports um, for a hot best port dam and roller plot dam. Um, and those are available on the CBC website under the resources tab and CBC also occasionally uh, posts those reports on uh, our social media as well. Thanks, David. Um, I'm aware that there are some questions that, are, that have been posed, but they have not been included in terms of who exactly they are directed to. So if you have a question that you put in the chat box and you have not indicated who it needs to go to, please do so, so that at least I can identify who exactly to, to ask. But in the meantime, let us go back to Jitin and I'm going to ask you, uh, a question from Lulama, who asked, will this method um, be able to detect the submerged aquatic vegetation? Um, so thanks for your question. Um, again, um, okay, so I haven't tied out the methods for detecting submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, however, there are other research papers that have shown it's possible to detect submerged plants with uh, remote sensing technology. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jitin. Um, Nonkazi, I will come back to you. There was another question from Josie who asked, will you also be considering testing density effects of crayfish populations on eDNA and whether dead crayfish or molds can be successfully detected? Um, well, I'll be using qPCR to basically um, estimate the abundance and with the, so what it will basically give me is the eDNA number of copies, and then I'll then try and co correlate that with the actual abundance that I got from using traditional sampling. So that's far, I'm going to go into the further dynamics of eDNA I'm considering to include that for my PhD because of time, I can't really do everything. So I need to also take that into consideration, but I do consider looking at the dynamics of eDNA and then include that for my PhD. Thank you, Nongkazi. Uh, David, um, there's another question for you here. And it says, do you think the fluctuations of water hyacinth over the years were due to the released insects or environmental conditions? Is there any assessment of the insects released in relation to the fluctuations? So yeah, that is the million dollar question. Um, how do we take remote sensing data and then relate it back to what we're seeing on the ground? And the first thing I just want to say is that remote sensing is part of a larger monitoring and assessment strategy. So the data uh, that we collect from satellites in and of itself isn't necessarily that useful uh, without the context of other environmental drivers and insect populations um, as well. Um, th there is some data uh, with regards to release of Megamelescutelis on Hot Port Dam as well as Rulaplot Dam. Um, we're still currently working on that. But there are, I just also want to mention that there are a couple remote sensing based methods that we can use to um, assess uh, herbivory on, on, on macrophage plants. And, and the one is uh, looking at NDVR. So NDVR monitors the, the relative health of the plant. And so we would expect a typical, you know, a, a winter, summer uh, variation of, of plant health over time. And if that, uh, sort of differs from, from the norm, then we can sort of uh, detect a potential agent herbiv herbivory. Um, uh, spraying as well also creates a similar effects, so you got to watch out for that. And then with, with the seasonal fluctuations, uh, we can also look at a healthy site and compare that to a site that has been, uh, that's had an agent uh, introduced onto it. And if we see that the 
seasonal fluctuations aren't matching what we'd expect, then we can uh, go in and investigate further. Thanks, David. I want to come to Robert. I have a question for you. And my question to you, Robert, is in terms of the work that you have been doing, what are the challenges that you have faced when trying to execute molecular identification on the different strains of the armyworm? And if there are any, how have you been able to overcome them? Thanks for the question. Um, so just to just to clarify that the strain identity of the colony I was working with wasn't really the focus of my study. It was more, you know, part of troubleshooting and trying to figure out what was going on um, with my research. Um, so as I highlighted, the kind of the, the best way that we have at the moment to overcome um, the confusion around the strain identities is to, to use both markers. So both that FOX1, which is the standard, and then the TPI marker as well. Um, and the reason why I highlight that is just because most of the, the samples that will probably be collected in field in South Africa will probably be descendants of hybrids. So we're not completely sure um, nuclear genome wise, what we're working with all the time, if I can put it that way. Um, and that then further gets confused when you put in a colony and then the stuff continuously um, inbreeds and it continues to mix. Um, so I think the best kind of way forward at the moment is just to be consistent with using both markers. Um, lots of the papers I've read so far would only use one marker. Um, and lots of them wouldn't even define the strain that they're working with. So I think that's you know, a, a big thing that I'm seeing as I'm reading papers and stuff. Um, so the best way that I overcame it was just using both markers and trying to be frequent with screening the colony. Thank you very much. Um, uh, David, there's still a very interesting question here for you. Um, I'm gonna come back to you and the question says, how do you tell the difference between the normal fluctuation in the amount of water hyacinth and the impact of the biological control agent? Yeah, so I sort of answered that in, in my last response where I was just saying that we can compare what we'd expect in the seasonal fluctuations and see if there's any variance from uh, that norm. And then we can use that to infer potential uh, changes in the water hyacinth population. Thank you, David. Um, I see that most of the questions that we had were for Grant and Keletso who are not here. So I think, I think in terms of that, oh, there's one here. Sorry, David, there's, there's one more for you. When did water hyacinth become reclassified podenteria and why? Um, so it was reclassified, I believe, about a year ago, and there is a paper on it. I can't uh, off the top of my head tell you exactly why. Um, I think perhaps uh, Prof. Julie Kutsia or Prof. Martin Hill uh, would be better qualified to answer that. I'm not, so, I'm not that sure. Okay, no, thanks, David. No, that's fine. I understand. Um, I think in terms of the questions that we had for the presenters who are here, that is all. So thank you very much to everybody uh, for your talks. And once again, thank you very much for all the answers that you have given us. Um, we can try again in terms of, you know, the other questions that were not answered probably via email. Um, but also I want to highlight that the, the answer to the last question um, where David asked for assistance uh, the answer is has been put in the in the chat, um, and the answer is basically that water hyacinth was changed to Podenteria in a paper by Pellegrini et al. in 2018. So I suppose that answers that um, last question. So right now we are going to move on to a video insert from um, our sponsor, and after that video we are then going to go to the seven poster presentations that shall come one after the other. And then after that, we will uh, go on a tea break. Thank you very much.
They'd heard about the successes of the fault management program that Husqvarna had implemented at Tala, our neighboring reserve. And we were particularly keen to get Divan and his team across to Kuhumbi to evaluate our processes. We are interested in conservation and particularly the importance of land maintenance. And it is important for us to get Husqvarna involved in order to give our animals the best possible environment to live in. Felt management is the rehabilitation and the generation of natural felt, um, whereby alien invasive plants is taken out and the felt is rehabilitated for a specific purpose. Here at Guahumi, for example, where we are now, is specifically rehabilitated for ecotourism, whereby all the alien invasive plants are eradicated to give the guest the uh, opportunity to see the felt in its purest and natural state. And also open up in, in specific areas to get animal movement going. As a conservation reserve, we are particularly interested in protecting obviously our wildlife and ensuring that the animals have the best habitat to thrive and live in. Well, this area next to road signs, this creates a nice environment for the guides to be able to show the animals in the natural environment. Husqvarna has always been our preferred product of choice. And not only do we believe that they have the most powerful products, but they also have an extensive dealer network. We first used a pole saw, the 535LK, to cut away the outer branches to make it more manageable. Thereafter, we brought in the 553 brush cutters with scarlet blades, clearing saw blades, to cut it flush to the ground. A nice flush cut with a clearing saw allows for no sharp edges. Once the stumps were cut, we applied herbicide, which has a red dye in it, so that you can clearly see where you have worked before. We took a triple five FRM with a mulching blade and we mastered it into smaller manageable pieces. We scattered the plants to create a brush packing effect, whereby you mesh the branches. So by the time that the decomposition does happen, your grass is established and you, you get a nice decent flush. It's been four months since our initial visit from the Husqvarna team and after the first good rains we took a trip down into the valley today to establish the results and we were blown away. There's an obvious increase in the growth of the grass due to the thickets having been removed and the sunlight and water um, being able to be captivated into the area. Having the right products has made a huge difference to this onerous task and it really is just thanks to the efficiency of both man and machine that our animals at Wohumbi are able to thrive in a far better environment. So felt management in a whole is there for productivity and obviously making a profit for the landowner. Opportunity to present our products to you today. My name is Devon from Mark, and I'm the business developer for Husqvarna South Africa for felt management. Husqvarna is a manufacturer of premium power products, where the focus is always on quality, durability, and assisting our customers with cost-effective solutions. Our products fits perfectly within felt management for the landowner who wants to eradicate invasive and encroaching plants quickly and selectively. We have compiled a toolbox of durable two-stroke machines to suit the application. Our toolbox is compiled to adapt with most management plans or eradication methods with the aim to make any difficult environment easier to engage and effectively cut vegetation with precision and ease for the operator. As an example, we have a range of pole saws from 25 to 35 cc's with interchangeable shaft lengths to cut away dents and thorny branches to make it easier and safer for the operators to get to the base of the tree. Strong 53cc brush cutters and clearing saws fitted with scarlet tooth blades to cut woody plants and smaller trees low and flush to the ground for better herbicide application and follow-up work. Clearing saws with mulching blades are also available for those landowners who desire to keep completed areas more accessible and softer on the eye. The 25cc motorized sprayer with a 15 or 25 liter capacity are also convenient for herbicide application. Our sprayers come standard with two lances for a direct spray 
Aura 3 nozzle lance for a softer mist spray. For those who still prefer the manual knapsack, our 15 litre knapsack sprayer comes with interchangeable and toolless parts, all fitted internally to make it more durable. We have a variety of chainsaws ranging from a 30cc to 118cc, all dedicated for specific purposes and will match the product with your requirements. We have the 578 BTF backpack blower, specifically designed and dedicated for fire management. Thank you for taking the time to view my presentation. For any further questions, you can contact me on 082-811-4579 or email me at divan.vermark at huskavanagroup.com. Thank you. Good day, my name is Debbie Muir. I will be presenting the poster on integrated control of floating macrophytes. Can biocontrol and aerial spraying at sublethal concentrations be effective? The Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment has been implementing integrated control of aquatic weeds for over three decades now. And the Ritterplot Dam was our pilot study on whether we can integrate chemical control um, and biological control at sublethal concentrations. The pesticide we trialed was a glyphosate-based herbicide, Kilo Max, which was a glyphosate sodium salt that we applied at a sublethal dosage um, at um, 1.55 gram, kilograms per hectare as opposed to 3.1 kilograms per hectare. Um, we first did a risk assessment using a primate risk tool and we used the ecotoxicity data and the environmental fate data to ascertain whether there would be any risks to the aquatic environment and the, and the um, aquatic invertebrates. As you will see in the results section, we had very good results um, where we were able to reduce the infestations by 85%. And our conclusions would be is yes, you are able to do um, the biocontrol and aerial spraying integrations, but there are some things that you need to consider, which would be to use the correct um, herbicide that does not contain any toxicic co-formulants and to do a proper environmental and social risk assessment prior to any, in, any applications and to ensure that you follow any legal processes prior to this. And also um, to ensure that um, all of the, um, the pesticides that you use is at sublethal dosages to reduce the loading of pesticide residues and the metabolites in our water bodies in South Africa. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Irem Iqbal and I am presenting here today the remote sensing techniques to be used for the discrimination of invasive plant species in some of the protected areas of Pakistan. So field spectrometers are basically best to use in order to analyze the hyperspectral data and in order to map the invasive species. The objective of my study is to uh, discriminate the potential of field spectroscopy in terms of species discrimination, as well as to find out the spectral differentiation using vegetation indices as well as wavelength spectra. So the study area consists of two protected forests, Lahiri Reserve Forest and Jindi Reserve Forest, and we conducted field surveys in 2018 and 2019 for collecting the spectral signatures of plant species. Almost 11 species were selected in the field, and after collecting spectral measurements, uh, some of the statistical analysis were performed, and also Jeffrey's Metoceta analysis was done to find out the best discrimination bands from the data. Results reveals that most of the spectral indices uh, shows significant differences among plant species. However, the edge position formula as well as the Vogelmann reflectance index shows best discrimination with almost 32 pairs of plant species. 
and it we also observe that each species responds differently with different indices for example lucina leucocephala was best discriminated using vegetation index with wavelength spectra we noted that 562 bands were uh, showed significant differences and nai region bands uh, contributed maximum in the differentiation of plant species and after that, the GM distance analysis also revealed that six bands show specific dis discrimination with different native and invasive plant species. So uh, we concluded that it is possible to identify the invasive species using uh, hyperspectral remote sensing data. Thank you. Stressosinensis is a dithyramycin fungus that causes an economically important stem canker disease of eucalyptus trees, where they are planted outside of their native range. It is one of two pathogens that independently causes this disease and is important from a South African perspective because it is distributed across plantations in Southern Africa. Around the globe, Stressosinensis populations have moderate to high genetic diversity. Our aim was to study the basis of this diversity and to look at gene evolution in this pathogen by comparing it to closely related species. To do this, we sequenced the genome of a South African isolate of Tresphera zinuensis, finding that the species is heterophallic. In other words, each individual had only one of the two mating type versions, and therefore they require a compatible partner for sexual reproduction. We also found that compatible partners were not evenly distributed in the global populations of Stratospherozoenses, indicating that sexual reproduction is likely not occurring. It is more likely that this pathogen has been introduced multiple times into each region from an unknown source. By comparing the Stratospherozoenses genome with those of other Stratospheros pathogens, it was clear that the two stem canker pathogens have undergone several gene expansions. They had many more unique gene families than did the leaf pathogens. These included secondary metabolite biosynthesis clusters and functional categories related to nutrition, such as amino acid, carbohydrates, and lipid metabolism. This illustrates the divergence in substrate use, host environment, and pathogenicity mechanisms between the stem canker and the leaf pathogens, and implies that the stem canker pathogens had to acquire novel genes in order to colonize their niche. Thank you for showing interest in our research. My name is Privilege Makunde, a PhD student at the University of Pretoria. Our poster presented a study on the host preference of Spondyliopsis bricatloides in South Africa. Spondyliopsis bricatloides is an insect that feeds on eucalyptus sap and was first reported in South Africa in 2014. This marked its first report outside Australia, its native range. This insect is now infesting commercial plantations of eucalyptus, but its space status is unknown, both in South Africa and in its native range. Due to its potential threat to the forest industry, a viable management solution such as the use of resistant genotypes needs to be investigated. So in this study, the objective was to identify the constitutive phytochemical characteristics underlying host preference of spondyospis. The first step was to score the level of Spondyaspis infestation on 19 eucalyptus species, and thereafter, six preferred and six non preferred eucalyptus species were selected. From these eucalyptus species, volatile and polar compounds were extracted and analyzed by gas chromatography mass spectrometry. We found differences in concentration of four volatile compounds between the preferred and non-preferred eucalyptus species. As for the polar compounds, we tentatively identified 13 compounds which correlated to non-preference. From this study, Spondyapsis displayed a clear preference for certain eucalyptus species, and the chemical variations between the eucalyptus species help explain this difference. The results provide important information in the understanding and utilizing of plant resistance against species. Thank you. Thank you for showing interest in my research. My name is Takuzo Comfort Madzivanzira. 
I'm a PhD student based at the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity Syab, and I'm registered with the Department of Ethiology and Fishery Science at Rhodes University. My poster presents a study that we conducted in Lake Kariba, Zimbabwe to compare two methods that were used in Southern Africa for the invasive red claw crayfish abundance studies in order to determine a standard gear to use for our crayfish surveys in the Zambezi Basin, as well as future crayfish studies in Africa. We assessed for differences in detection probability and catch per unit effort of operator traps baited with cooked maize meal used for crayfish surveys in Zimbabwe compared to collapsible proma traps baited with dry dog food used for crayfish surveys in South Africa and Swaziland. Detection probability and catch per unit effort were significantly higher for proma collapsible traps than for operator traps. There was a weak correlation between the catch per unit effort of the two trapping methods and the slope of the line was 2.68, which means that results collected via the opera traps baited with cooked maize meal should therefore be upcalculated by a factor of 2.68 for the data to be comparable across the region. From this study, we recommend the use of proma collapsible traps baited with dry dog food as a standard gear for red claw abundance studies in Africa. For more information about the methodology and results, feel free to contact me on the email address or Twitter as shown on the poster. Good evening, Zulu Sazulu. Today I'm presenting about an assessment of the potential overlap between biocontrol and chemical control interventions that are aimed at managing invasive alien plants in KZN. There are various organizations which are involved in managing invasive alien plants in the region. And the challenge is that a possible overlap of these two interventions has not been scrutinized. For our methods, we extracted geographical locations data for sites where biocontrol agents were released and for sites where alien clearing projects are located from Department of Forestry and Fisheries for financial year 2019-2020. We then plotted these geographical locations together in a map and the resulting map showed both interventions in one map where 13% of biocontrol locations were observed to overlap with alien clearing locations. However, these overlaps were a result of an integrated approach for water weeds management. No overlaps were detected for terrestrial weeds, and the locations where overlap were detected were from Sunduzi River and Wewe River. We conclude that for the 2019-2020 financial year, there were no overlaps which were unintentional. And we also conclude that the overlaps that were detected were for water weeds only, and there are no overlaps of interventions for any of the terrestrial species. We recommend that there be an improvement in information sharing, and we recommend the development of a system where all interventions can be recorded and accessible to all stakeholders. Thank you. Hi, my name is Takudzo Kamfot Madzwanzira. I'm from Rhodes University and my poster presents a study that we carried out to fill in the knowledge gap on crayfish impacts in Africa by estimating their potential socioeconomic and ecological impacts through laboratory consumption and scavenging experiments. For the ecological aspect, we used the pondweed, potamogeton species and quantified the consumption rates of the two crayfish species, that is the red claw and the red swamp crayfish, which are spreading rapidly across the continent relative to a native analog, that is the freshwater crab of the potamonatus genus. For the socio-ecological components, 
we qualitatively and quantitatively determined scavenging of a dead native fish species, that is the Mozambique tilapia by the two crayfish species also relative to a native crab. Scavenging on dead tilapia was used as proxies for fish catches in artisanal gillnet fisheries, whereas the pondweed represents ecologically important macrophytes. The damage by the red claw on fish was significantly higher than the other two decapods, while least the red swamp had a significantly higher consumption of macrophytes than the other two decapods at all temperature treatments. Based on the scavenging experiments and fishery data from Kafue River Flats in Zambia, we show that crayfish can cause damages of up to 1,500 tons in catch losses per year, which translates to an overall annual potential loss of 2 million United States dollars. These impacts are of high concern and warrant efforts to prevent their introduction and spread to minimize the socioeconomic and ecological losses. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to um, session four. Um, this part of the session is um, session 4B, um, where we'll be having a look at um, still the management of biological invasions, but having a look at more the actual management that's taking place on the ground. So there's going to be some exciting talks, um, whether it be in national parks or, or focusing on an um, estuary um, and a couple of others having a look at herbicides and their interactions with biocontrol agents. So it should be a very exciting session. Um, for those of you that have just joined us or weren't part of the earlier session, um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, please keep yourselves um, muted and videos off for the duration of the, of the, the session. Um, um, for any questions and answers, there's a question and answer um, um, icon on your screen um, and just post whatever question and uh, with the at sign with the next to the presenter's name and that'll just give us who the question's directed to. Um, just something else to take note of is um, at um, quarter to five there will be a workshop um, which will be um, indicators used to monitor biological invasions at a national level um, this will be still part of the session, so you don't need to um, join in any other way, but just carry on in the session. Um, and I think Kim will be um, chairing that. Um, and there are questions, you will be able to raise your hand and ask questions, um, but I think um, Kim will get into more detail when, when at the start of that workshop. Um, I think as far all the housekeeping rules have been um, um, I have said all that, um, so I think we can get into the session. Thank you very much for joining us. Good day, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share some updates on the invasive species situation in our national parks and some of the management and approaches that we're trying to follow. So I'll touch briefly on invasive species in parks generally, and then I'll focus in on Kruger National Park, which has some of our bigger problems. And then I'll briefly touch on protected areas in Africa and globally. So in sand parks, we have about 663 uh, species. Of All of these occur in 19 national parks. And mammals occur 18 in the national parks. We have about 26 alien mammal species. Birds occurring in 17 of the national parks. So you can see that most, many of our national parks have been invaded to some extent. Just taking some of the most invaded 
parks out. You can see Kruger has got the most species, just under 400 species. Around 360 of those are alien plants. Now, obviously, not all of these are invasive. It's just it's a, a comprehensive list of everything that we've found to date. Table Mountain, just under 300 alien species, and then the garden route with about 270 alien species. So you can see these parks have to deal with a substantial number of plants or animals between them. Just taking these top five uh, parks, I've put them in a graph of funding spent over the last 15 years or so and scaled it to 100 million about. And you can see that more than 120 million has been spent in the garden route. Table Mountain and Kruger, just over 100 million. And then you have Agalis and Addo with just over 60 million rand spent on alien plant control. Then delving straight into Kruger National Park, some of the priorities that we're trying to address is related to threats, pathways, and the broader landscape through work we've done. Previously, we know that some of the pathways of invasion into the park, so now that we want to try to start identifying and quantifying some of these. I'll also touch on the priority of the large cell scale programs. Some of these are still challenges for us. Um, others have been successful. And then mention policies and planning approaches that we've, we've taken. Although Kruger is a large area, it fits in this very large landscape of different land use types. And these land uses include high int intensity urban areas, commercial forestry, com uh, communal rangelands, and natural areas. And these all have different alien species, and these are, have different abilities to invade the park and have pressure. We also have this enormous river catchment going through the park, and some of these rivers go up several hundred kilometers outside of Kruger, from the west of the park down through to Mozambique. And we only manage a very small portion of these rivers. So we are largely at the mercy of what control programs take place on our boundaries or further upstream. We also have a large road network that has the potential for introducing species and spreading them, such as Parthenia. Parthenia has been in the park for a number of years. And we've spent several million rand trying to combat the plant using chemical control. And in the last few years, have been releasing biological control at the site down near Crocodile Bridge in the southeast of, of, of the park. Hyacinth is still one of our most challenging species on the Letava River covers his seasonal pools and the Inglot Dam near Letaba Race Camp it gets completely closed. We have these annual high flows and occasionally these extreme flood events that do wash the plants away. But then it doesn't take too long and we see these same effects and the plants have recovered and covering those same areas. The challenge that we have is that we are using biocontrol and have been releasing the insects for some time. However, we know that they take a bit of time and you need to have some patience. But there's a challenge on management to, to get some quick control uh, implemented. And there can often be pressure to use con chemical control, for example, as helicopter spraying across the rivers. A major concern though for us was last year we found hyacinth in the Sabi River. It's the first time to my knowledge that hyacinth has been found in the Sabi catchment. So we need to also now start 
working on this. Sunset Dam has been one of our successful biocontrol programs. Many of you are familiar with it. Once the insects were released, it took a few years, but then we gradually came down to the point we've had, we've had complete control uh, since 2002. However, Auckland Dam remains a bigger challenge. Uh, this because Auckland is very seasonal. It has periods where it dries out completely. Obviously, all the plants die. Or it has high flows and washes away all the plants. And these seasonal dynamics com complicate control. So it goes through these cycles of invaded, dry, flooded, and then regrows. And even when we introduce the biocontrol, which we have done numerous times over a number of decades, the problem remains is that the seasonal dynamics is extremely quick and we get these flushing or drying events and the biocontrol doesn't get a chance to get on top of the problem. Puntia Strictia, familiar to many people, the program in the park and we have been successful using the cochineal, which we're now rearing and releasing around Skakuza. And there's been a long, long history of success using these, in, these insects, as you can see in these plots um, that have not since remained completely clear of Puntia. As I mentioned, we've been working on developing policies and planning, and we've tried to streamline these in order to improve the way we implement programs and try to maximize the resources that we do have available. We do know that from literature, there's a dire need for work to be done across Africa and these numerous papers that come from East Africa, Serengeti, uh, and elsewhere showing the situation that, that we, that's of high concern. And this is even can be scaled up to a global level where protected areas around the world are facing the same problems. And the, the contribution that we can play at this time is to, through the IPBES, thematic assessment on invasive avian species, as one of the deliverables is specifically focused on managing invasive avian species in protected areas. And hopefully through this, the information that we can provide can filter through down to managers on the ground. We know that the cost of invasions are increasing from this recent publication. And however, the rules of the game have changed with the arrival of COVID last year. And with these economic costs of invasions increasing, this new world context, there's massive implications for protected areas. As funding is decreasing after lack of tourism, but invasions are increasing. So this is going to place increasingly difficult pressure on us in how we can manage invasions in the future. And thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Norwe Tuchali, and I'll be talking about the management of Spatina altiniflora in Hrodbrak um, estuary. So um, Spatina altiniflora um, is a cold grass adapted to living to salt marshes and estuaries. Um, it is native to Atlantic and Gulf coasts of North America. It is known um, to be an, uh, an aggressive invader worldwide. Spatina altiniflora poses a threat um, to water resources, water dependent biodiversity and related ecosystem services. Um, in South Africa, it also has the potential to hybridize with the native Spatina maritima. In South Africa, Spatina altiniflora was discovered in 2004 in one locality, that is the Hrodbrak estuary near George. The arrival mechanism of this species um, to this site um, is unknown. 
so Crowbrack um, is a is a, Crowbrack um, estuary is a temporarily open or closed um, estuary. Um, the mouth remain closed for about three to eight months um, during winter. There is an upstream dam near the estuary that is managed. So the fresh water from the dam is released annually in spring or summer to keep the mouth open. This is the first record of Spartina altiflora found in an estuary that closes to sea. This graph here shows you how much Spartina altiflora has expanded over the years. So um, in 2011, um, um, this is when Working for Water um, started with the first control of this population. Um, so the stance here, um, it's not really a good measure to say how the population is behaving because the stance um, can join together when the population is not managed and become less. So rather focus here on the area occupied by Spartina over the years. So research shows that um, Spartina altiniflora can, sp can spread at a rate of 0 0.15 hectares per year if left unmanaged. This is the, um, the extent of the population we are currently dealing with. Um, so we uh, have um, these, uh, it's 20 patches, um, and the size of the patches, um, it's not the same. You can see um, it's different um, sizes. Um, these patches in total, they occupy about one hectare. So since 2004, colleagues at NMU um, did much baseline research on the impacts, the ecology, and the spread of Spartina altiniflora in Schroedbrook. This research was important because at this time, there was no attempt to control the plant and the chemical, physical, and ecological impacts could be studied. So control of this population started um, years later. So when it comes to the actual control or management of the population, we tried um, different control measures. So in 2004 to 2010, no management happened. 41% um, of the estuary was invaded by Spartina altiniflora. In 2011, Working for Water initiated the control using mechanical control. This method was not effective. It stimulated growth and created large below ground biomass. In 2013, Sanby got involved and we used um, a foliar herbicide application using these two, a mixture of these two herbicides, like the glyphosate and imazapone. This method um, was effective in providing better results. And um, this is the mixture of herbicides um, that we are using. So we also tried um, mowing and um, with um, and applying um, and immediate stem treatment um, with herbicide. So, but um, so this area here that we see in this picture in the foreground um, is the area that was mowed and um, and 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 applied with herbicide. And then the the in the background of this picture here, the brown patch that you see here is the area that was just foliar sprayed. So already you can see how healthy this one is looking and and then this one like um, is dying. So the, the, the mowing um, was also not effective. The next scientific paper was then published, um, which provided evidence of the adaptive traits of Spartina in the Hrothbrak estuary. So the paper also used the data from the control measures at this time to show that um, um, in, in the Hrothbrak context, um, chemical control was far more effective than mechanical control. So um, the systematic control and monitoring was carried out twice a year um, during the growth period, um, uh, starting in spring and ending in autumn since 2013. So the objective here was to characterize the population and measure response to control measures. So um, from 2015, we also started um, recording additional data on native species recruitment and cover. So already here um, um, in these pictures, you can, you can see um, where we started from and um, how the site was looking like um, in, in, in 2014, a year later, after we started with the control. So um, by 2015, the number of live stems um, was 145 compared to 429 live stems that, were, that was recorded in 2009. And the, to the total area affected was 10 square meters compared with the total area of 
10,221 square meters that was recorded in 2011. So already you can see that um, the population was shrinking um, yeah, over, over the years. The exciting part of the project um, so uh, is that um, no life plants of Spartina alteriflora have been observed um, since November of 2016, but we still continue to do those um, annual checks. In, um, we started seeing a lot of um, dieback of Spartina alteriflora. So the dead um, uh, sticks in the foreground of this picture is Spartina alteriflora. And the reddish green vegetation in the background of this picture um, is the indigenous Sacroconia species occupying the salt marsh area that was previously occupied by Spartina alteriflora. This is cool. Right? Another set of um, cool pictures. So this was um, 2013, and then this is how the site was looking like in 2016. Um, more cool pictures. Um, so this is, we started here, you know, we used to record, record like um, hundreds of Spartina alteriflora. And then from there, we record um, many dead stamps of Spartina alteriflora. And then from there, we started recording um, native, um, um, uh, native um, vegetation without seeing any live um, Spartina alteriflora. Again, um, the green vegetation here is Sacaconia species occupying an area that was previously occupied by Spartina alteriflora. Um, more cool pictures. Okay, so um, factors favoring extirpation of Spartina alteriflora is number one. Um, there's only one known population and the size of this population is small. It occupies um, about um, one hectare. So um, this population, the full, um, this one um, in, in Krugbrak, um, um does not produce um, viable seed, which is great. Um, the site um, is easily accessible and it is also like um, relatively easy to distinguish um, Spartina alteriflora from other estuarine grasses and sedges. And the amazing support we received from the residents um, that is one of the things that, uh, that contributed um, to the success of this project, actually. There were challenges as well, but I'm not gonna go through them due to time. So in conclusion, um, this is one of the few examples of a national prospect of extirpation of an invasive alien plant. Um, so we're gonna continue monitoring as well as to uh, check other estuaries that may be at risk. NMU is now responsible for this project um, in consultation with Sandy, of course. Um, so let's hope um, to have many more years um, without seeing Spartina alteriflora, and eventually we can close shop and celebrate. Um, thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'm Raleigh Ludo, Biodiversity Officer of Production for the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. I will be doing my presentation with regards to the, the, the diversity of biological, biological invasion in the Western Cape for the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. I will be talking about the service providers that is doing the implementation of the special projects in the Western Cape. There is four service providers doing the implementation for the special projects. It's Cape Nature, Advanced Environmental Corporation, City of Cape Town, and the West Coast Districts Municipality. So, um, Cape Nature is responsible for the biological control invasive alien fish projects in the Western Cape. The invasive alien fish projects is um, based in Haukama and in the Ciudad Burger. Bur. The biological control is, situa, is based in Yonkersuk, Fruelekate, and the Ochanikwa. The biological control team is responsible for the collections, releases, and monitoring of the biological control agents in the Western Cape. They are using the protocols that is provided by the researchers in order to uh, implement the biological control in the Western Cape. Then Advanced Environmental Corporation is the other service provider that is responsible for the eradication of the feral pigs, 
in the Rebecca Steel Sauron and a full flay dam area in the Western Cape. They are also responsible for the flora conservation, fauna and flora conservation in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. Since 2018, they have eradicated 244 uh, feral pigs. On the slide, you see a picture of the trap that they use to catch the feral pigs at night. What happens, they, they put food in the center of the trap and there's a gate at the trap and on the gate there's a camera that records the feral pigs as they, as they enter the trap. The camera is connected to a cell phone that counts the feral pigs as they enter the trap. When there's six to seven uh, feral pigs in the trap, the hunters will come and shoot them. City of Cape Town is the other service provider that is responsible for the implementation of the guttural toads, eradication, mullet ducks, eradication. They are clean, they are working on the aquatics in the city of Cape Town area. They also do early detection rapid response project. They're also responsible for the house crows eradication in the city of Cape Town. They also uh, implement ecosystem restoration projects. In the, in the Western Cape. The guttural toads is the one project I have, uh, I wanted to, want to highlight, and that is how to identify the guttural toad. Is there's a, on the back of the toad, there's a line that's, that goes as I show, and then there's a line crossing that line in the middle of the, of the, the toad's back from eye to eye. That cross indicates that it is a guttural toad that needs to be eradicated. The West Coast Districts Municipality is responsible for the aquatics uh, that is uh, problematic on the Berg River. We have one team that is spraying from the boats on the water, or the water ice and, and the water lettuce, that is the biggest problem in this area. And there's a second team that is working on the riparian zone, removing the invasive alien plants from the riparian zones. Then that's about the four, the four um, service providers it's that's, that's doing the implementation for the special projects in the Western Cape. I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. And if you need to get, want to know more about uh, the other projects and what they are doing, you are welcome to contact me on the following information that is on the screen. Good day, my name is Debbie Muir. I'll be presenting on the pesticide use in NRM programs in South Africa, the emphasis on aquatic weeds. The outline for the presentation today will include the international legislations, toxicity and exposure criteria and classifications of the pesticides, the natural resource management programs and the, and the pesticide policy, and the aquatic weeds dealt with in the NRM programs, and two aquatic weed pesticides commonly used within the aquatic weeds programs, and the environmental fate of these pesticides. The Rotterdam Convention, um, Annex 3, which deals with the prior informed consent, helps countries make informed decisions regarding the import of banned or restricted pesticides. The Stockholm Convention, the persistent organic pollutants, deals with the elimination and restriction of use and manufacturing of persistent organic pollutants, or otherwise known as POPs. POPs, um, are also known as the Dirty Dozen, and um, as part of these are also the industrial pollutants or industrial pops that, are, that, are be, that can be found in chemical, um, industrial chemicals, as well as plastics, the BBCs, and also the unintended byproducts um, such as dioxins and furans. The third convention is known as the Basel Convention, or more specifically for Africa, the Bamako Convention, which deals with stockpiles and disposal of empty containers. 
Um, on this slide, you can see the hazard classifications for pesticides. The World Health Classification has got five categories from a 1A, extremely hazardous, to a U, which is unlikely to present an acute hazard. And the carcinogenic classifications from a group one to a group four, and the most popular or the one that's been in the news lately is glyphosate that has changed categories, has been upgraded from a group 2B to a group 2A, which has moved from possibly carcinogenic to probably carcinogenic to humans. And the global harmonization um, system for classification and labeling of systems, or known as GHS, um, has five categories, which has replaced the World Health Organization classification. And you can see that uh, the classifications has got um, more detailed hazard statements, um, which um, is linked to the WHO, but has, has more detailed um, with regards to fa the fatalities and the toxicities with regards to the LD50s um, for the oral and dermal classifications. In the NRM programs, we have the Working for Water programs, the Working on Fire programs, the Working for Wetlands, Ecosystem Services and Forest programs. And together, all these programs um, have got around um, just under 2 billion rand spent nationally. And um, at most of these programs use pesticides within their programs. So there is a huge risk to human health and environmental fate. And that is, that is why it is extremely important to ensure that the pesticide policy, policies con, uh, comply to international best practice and the um, hazardous chemicals agents legislation that has just been promulgated in South Africa. So the herbicide or pesticides policy, as it's now been updated to, does not just include pesticides or herbicides. It also includes pesticides to deal with animals. It includes biopesticides. We're on version 14 already, and it includes all species control methods and dosages. It also includes the recommendations for the herbicide usages. The hazard exposure and risk in information is included for all the pesticides that we use. But most importantly, we've now included the biomonitoring information regarding the frequency and duration that biomonitoring is needed. And it complies to the global harmonization system and the hazardous chemical agents um, regulations in line with the new legislation just promulgated. Um, the pesticides um, policy is also actually an integrated pest management plan, as it also includes biological control. So the pesticide policy um, includes various treatment methods, um, a whole bunch of formulations, different herbicides, um, bio and various biopesticides. But most importantly, it, it uses three herbicide categories out of the 48 um, standard herbicide categories, and the importance of this is that those three herbicide categories are the least damaging to environmental uh, risk and to human health. And what's most important of this is none of the pesticides used within the departmental policy contain polythoxylated taloamine, which is a carcinogenic adjuvant that was banned by Act 36 in June 2020. Um, in this table, you will see this is an excerpt from our pesticide policy. It gives you an indication of the species or the herbicides that is registered for this species. But what's most important around this is we've given a recommended product, um, which is the safest to use with regards to the ecotoxicity, the biomonitoring, the human health impacts, and the environmental fate, um, as well as we've given caution statements where necessary and we've given the proper um, application and dosages of how to mix the pesticide accordingly. This table shows the global harmonization categories of the different chemical classes um, of the pesticides with their classifications, with also the acute LD50s, oral and dermal, the acceptable daily intakes, the acute reference doses, and the acceptable operator exposure levels. And this is important so that you can, uh, when you're choosing what is the safest pesticide to use in your environment or in your um, application class, 
that you know what the classification is of the certain pesticides, whether it's an acute tox, is it's eye damaging, um, and whether it's carcinogenic, et cetera. This slide gives you an information which is more very important if you look at the HIRAC herbicide group codes. These give in, uh, codes of where the pesticides fall in the same mode of action, and you'll notice that the top eight fall in the same group, which means they have the same mode of action, and this causes a concern when it comes to potential uh, resistance building using uh, pesticides in the same HIRAC group. So this is a concern for the department in, poten in potential resistance building um, of certain pesticides. Um, if you're looking at the aquatic species, this is more complicated than most. Um, if you're looking at terrestrial, there's various category 1As, 1Bs, and category 2s. Um, so there's um, a species management list with the herbicide registrations or emergency registrations. And you will notice that four of our species are under complete biocontrol under category 1B. In this slide, you will see the floating macrophytes. Four of them um, we have under complete biological control or substantial control. So that is the only uh, method that we currently use in the department for uh, the control method. And obviously, certain species like the water hyacinth, for instance, still needs an integrated control plan. And for submerged aquatic weeds, we have the same situation where we are implementing biological control as the agents become available, but here we still need to implement chemical control um, where necessary. Um, here I've shown a, a comparison of herbicides for aquatic weeds. Um, you will see that the two that are registered in the country for submerged aquatic weed control and floating macrophytes is glyphosate and diquat dibromide. If you look at the GHS classifications um, and the explanations and the toxicity, you will notice that glyphosate, if it does not contain polyethoxylated teloamine, is actually safer to use than diquat dibromide. Um, here you can see um, um, a map from the National Prioritization Tool from Dabrowski, the um, agricultural use of glyphosate in the country. So um, this is the concern with the glyphosate, hence the reason why we are trying to implement more biological control and reduce the amount of pesticides used by the department. The same applies here for the map um, from Dabrowski for the DICO. Um, this is just information shown on the in, in, uh, available information on environmental fate and, and transport, as well as toxicity data that is available through the Dabrowski tool. Um, you can see also here that you can get papers available um, on various um, research on uh, glyphosates, um, the, the metabolites, etc. So the way forward would be pesticide residue testing in water, uh, maximum residue levels of pesticides that are updated, implementing the hierarchy of control of pesticide management according to the FAO pesticide code of conduct, implementing biopesticides, and most importantly, biomonitoring according to the GHS and the HCA. Thank you. Hey, my name is Luisa Zulu. Today I'm presenting about an assessment of the magnitude and cost of herbicides used to manage invasive alien plants in South Africa. Herbicides are widely used to manage invasive alien plants. However, in our country, we don't have a national tracking system for quantities and cost of herbicides used for nature conservation purposes. Although this information is very crucial because it assists us to weigh the risks and the benefits against the cost of herbicides used. It provides in objective information that um, assists us in decision making so that decisions are based on evidence rather than personal beliefs. It guides herbicide manufacturers towards improving herbicides based on safety and efficacy. 
Today, I'm only presenting data from Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment in KZN. We collected data for types of herbicides, their quantities, and then we calculated their cost starting from 1996 up until 2020. And we arranged the data into five groups where each group consists of five um, different financial years. In this chart here, the data that I presented was uh, transformed using a square root to aid visualization of the significantly low data values. The trend shows that in the first um, 10 years, herbicide usage was significantly lower than, from, than in the last 15 years of the observations. The highest herbicide usage was detected between 2006 and 2010 with a median of about 15 tons. Thereafter, herbicide usage declined to three tons and then declined again to two tons. And then it remained more or less the same in the last 10 years of the observations. When we looked at weight, according to active ingredient, we detected five active ingredients used in the program with Triroxipa and Picloram being significantly lower than the other active ingredient, which were glyphosate, imazepa, and triclopa. The highest, uh, the highest active ingredients, triclopa and imazepa, were not significantly different. Again, the cost of herbicides were transformed with the square roots for visualization of the low uh, values. And the same trend is observed again, where the cost were the lowest between 96 and 2005. And those costs were significantly different from the subsequent 15 years. The data shows that uh, the highest costs that were incurred for herbicide usage were those between 2006 and 2010 with the median of about 1 million rands. And then after the cost declined and remained more or less the same at above half a ton. When we looked at cost of the different active ingredient, we observed that fluoroxipa and picloram had significantly the lowest cost and the highest cost were incurred for mesopa and triclopa. It's important to note that triclopa had the highest cost, but these costs must be weighed against the, pro against the properties of that active ingredient because triclopa is a very volatile um, active ingredient. So we have to ask ourselves whether those costs are worth it. We conclude that costs uh, and quantities of herbicide use for nature conservation purposes remained low in the first 10 years of the observed data and then reached a maximum in 2010 and then stayed more or less the same in the past 10 years. The highlight of the study is that glyphosate usage was low. This is important because native plants that co okay with these invasive species are not glyphosate tolerant. We also detected a narrow range of herbicide use, which is a bit of a concern because if the herbicides of the same groups are used repeatedly, it might pose a risk of the invasive plants developing resistance. When we are interacting with the invasive species managers, we noted that we need to improve on record keeping for herbicides used, and we also need to improve on information sharing. I'd like to acknowledge these organizations as well as these people. Thank you for listening. This is my email address. I would like to ask those of you who use herbicides to manage invasive alien plants to so kindly share your data with us, please. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm here to give you a talk on the integration of herbicides in biological control on Parthenia mycerophorus in South Africa. Parthenia mycerophorus is a highly invasive annual herb that has invaded South Africa, and it is a threat to our environment, agriculture, as well as human and animal health. There is widespread chemical control operations in, that are taking place in different regions, and they are using registered herbicides in South Africa. 
There is also biological control programs with several introduced insect species and pathogens. So because of that, there is spatial and temporal overlap of chemical and biological control operations. And we had to determine whether herbicide use on pathenium weed impacts on agents in order to optimize the efficacy of biological control in South Africa. Performance of a leaf feeding cyclogramma by Colorado was assessed when exposed to a selective herbicide, which is one of the registered herbicides in South Africa. It was assessed under no choice and choice test, wherein we had sprayed plants and unsprayed plants, each with five pairs of Zygogramma by Colorata adults replicated six times. All the trials were run up until 50% of the adults on sprayed plants are dead. And then on choice test, the insects had a choice between sprayed and unsprayed plants, but in no choice, the insects did not have a choice between a sprayed and unsprayed plant. So we did this by spraying plants with 0.5% perchlorium and allowed them to dry for three hours before the adults are exposed on the plants into the cage. And then after every two days, we did assessments for adult survival and adult location. But on choice test, we were rotating plants after each and every assessment. On a weekly basis, plants were replaced with the same treatment and adult feeding score was assessed on a score level of 0 to 5 and we also did egg counts per plant. Plants were held for the second week for egg hatching and every two days we did first insta level counts. If you can look at oviposition results on your left there, your y-axis is the mean number of eggs per plant per week and x-axis is our treatments which is sprayed and unsprayed plants and you can see that more eggs were laid on unsprayed plants and less eggs on sprayed plants and then moving to the right there is egg hatching results your y-axis is the mean number of life per plant per week and x-axis is the same treatments and you can see that more eggs hatched from plants that were unsprayed and less on spread plants and you can see that comparing the off position results and egg hatching results there was more survival from egg stage to first insta level stage on unsprayed plants under choice test if you can look at off position results on your left you will see that your y axis is showing you the mean number of eggs per plant per week and your x axis is our treatments which is sprayed plants and unsprayed plants and still there is more eggs laid on unsprayed plants and less eggs on sprayed plants. Moving to the right on egg hatching results, your y axis is showing you the mean number of larvae per plant per week and your x axis is the same treatments. But you can see that still there is more egg hatching on unsprayed plants and less egg hatching on sprayed plants. Exposure of Zygogramma by Colorata adults on plants that were sprayed with 0.5% perchlorium had a negative impact on the beetle of position and larval hatching. Because of time restrictions, I couldn't present results on larval development, but I evaluated larval development by exposing first insta larvae of Zygogramma by Colorata on plants that were sprayed with 0.5% perchlorium and there was no difference in terms of development between larvae that were exposed on sprayed plants and unsprayed plants. So we need a careful consideration of integration of chemical and biocontrol operations in South Africa. And we have to, by all means, avoid chemical and biocontrol operations at the same field sites. And future objectives will be to assess the stem boring with Lysteronotus penis on plants that are sprayed with 0.5% perchlorium. I would love to acknowledge the funders and each individual that participated. I thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Turner, a restoration ecologist at Cape Nature. I'd like us to take a fresh look at biocontrol for pines today. The Western Cape province has a massive problem with invasive pine trees and their associated effects on water and biodiversity. They are fast growing and spread very rapidly. They outcompete and shed out many Spain cranberry species, which eventually leads to the loss of species in long invaded areas. Our existing control methods have proved insufficient to solve the problem. And to date, no biocontrol agents have been released. 
find sylviculture solvaria via control agents and possible associated pathogens. Pine biocontrol in South Africa has a short and slightly unsatisfactory history. Hoffman and his colleagues published a history of the research and concerns of biocontrol for pines in 2011. They lay out the debate well and conclude that resolving this divergence of opinion between forestry on one hand and conservation goals on the other is a challenge going forward. But no progress has been made since then and urgent action is now required. So hence, it's time for review. Of the proposed biocontrol agents, the weevil, the Sodes validirostris, and particularly the Iberian clade of this weevil, has been proposed. And the clades are important because that may affect their feeding preferences. These weevils are seed feeders and so do not directly the wood products that the forestry industry strives to produce. However, the introduction of this weevil has been abandoned due to fears of the weevil spreading pine pitch kink, which I'll come back to in a moment. Other proposed biocontrol agents include the moths Diarectria menticella and Pinea. They too feed on cones, but no progress was made with these two potential agents because they could not be successfully reared in captivity. Another proposed agent is the mite Chrysotecus and new air money, which also depends on, on developing cones, but this agent was abandoned with out trials due to fears that it may not be effective. Now back to pine pitch canker itself, Fusarium circinatum, which is a fungal pathogen and perhaps the real worry behind Sodi's biocontrol agent. Fusarium circinatum first appeared in South Africa in a single forestry nursery in 1990 on Pinus patula. It was subsequently recorded on Pinus radiata in the Cape Peninsula in 2007, and about 2008, Wingfield and colleagues records it as being spread to most pine growing forestry nurseries in South Africa. So how does pine pitch canker get around? This is a widespread pathogen. It's both windborne and rainborne. In addition, can be spread by many man animals, including humans and a wide variety of insects. And it's not just, it doesn't just occur on pines. It is also hosted by grass species and various dicot species. Despite this, um, Wingfield and colleagues in 2008 say that the slow establishment of pine pitch canker from the nurseries to plantations in South Africa is probably due to a variety of different factors, including our climate, low initial levels of airborne inoculum, importantly, an absence of effective insect vectors and winding agents, and the lack of associations between native biota and the plantation trees. Back in 2009, the Weevil Pesodes validirostris was evaluated for its potential role as a biocontrol agent on pines. And they did some experiments in which they gave infected Pinus radiata leader shoots to Pesodes validirostris, um, but did not manage to show any transmission of the fungal canidia, which is the means by which the fungus reproduces. However, they did find that the feeding damage from the weevils did appear to facilitate the ingress of the fungus into the host plant, causing them to conclude, somewhat oddly I argue, that it's recently been decided not to pursue this further due to risks associated with pine pitch canker in South Africa, where the disease is already present, and because of questions about the effectiveness of biocontrol relying solely on cone and seed insects. However, what I think Lennox and colleagues were doing at that point was conflating risk and damage. I think they did successfully demonstrate that Pisodes validirostris could facilitate the ingress of the fungus and thus damage by the agent is possible. But any damage by any agent, biological or otherwise, may facilitate ingress of Fusarium cisinatum. And we know that the related weevil, Pisodes nemorensis, is already present in the Western Cape province and that pines may display pine pitch canker symptoms without any wounding, leading me to ask, what is actually the net increasing risk of pine pitch, pine pitch canker disease from the Iberian clade of Pisodes validirostris? So currently, the effectiveness of Pisodes validirostris as an agent of biocontrol in the Western Cape has not been trialed or measured. 
the risk or even the increase in risks of transfer of pine pitch canker have not been quantified or evaluated in any way, but the perceptions of risk have impeded further research. And we are not alone in our problems with pine trees and lack of biocontrol for them. New Zealand sit with a similar situation with a suite of invasive pine trees and are also interested in assessing biocontrol to help them control their pines. Brokharoff et al, however, make the same effectiveness mistake. They also identify Posodes validirostris as a promising biocontrol agent, but state that, furthermore, it is not certain how effective a biocontrol agent would be in terms of reducing the spread of wilding pines. But I ask, where is the evidence of effectiveness or lack of effectiveness? Effectiveness needs, effectiveness needs to be assessed before an agent is abandoned. Effectiveness also depends on your definition of a desired outcome. I suggest we rather trial the agents and measure the responses. One's definition of adequate biocontrol is at stake here. And I don't think that biocontrol needs to be seen as a silver bullet that will solve all problems. What we need here is a significant slowing of pine reproduction. Every pine seed that does not grow does not be, need to be controlled as a pine tree. This will save both time and money. Outbreak levels of biocontrol agents are not required in the integrated management program. Biocontrol is but one tool in our toolbox of options. It is the combined effect of all the tools that is the outcome of interest to us. If agent number one does not meet this requirement, then identify and test biocontrol agent number two, and so on. And hopefully, one will find a successful agent. So this raises a couple of research questions that I think now need urgently to be answered. First among these is what is the net increase in the risk of pine pitch canker from the addition of the weevil Posodes vididirostris? One could hypothesize that there is a negligible increase in the risk in the Western Cape from introducing the Iberian clade of this weevil. One could also hypothesize that the increased risk of pine pitch canker due to this weevil in forestry would be vanishingly small in relation to other risks, such as the risk of fire in plantations. Another question that needs to be answered is, is pine pitch canker doing serious damage in the Western Cape? And if not, why not? Posodes nemorensis, many other insects and other vectors of the disease are already present. Pine pitch canker ecology and epidemiology seems very complex and quite variable across the world and is not yet fully understood. So I'd also wonder what the varying, what is causing the varying levels of prevalence and impact of this disease. This might help us answer the question of where should we put our effort in controlling pine pitch canker. Are nurseries and people not a far bigger source of concern than the sources of infection and vectors rather than the biocontrol agents that have been proposed? To me, it seems that the solution to the pine pitch canker problem seems to lie in silvicultural practices and the selection of resistant forestry species and varieties. In conclusion, the highly biodiverse and water-stressed Western Cape Province cannot afford pine invasions to continue. We need all the tools we can get working in concept to impede pine invasions as far as possible. I urge that we restart biocontrol research and quantify the net change in risk with biocontrol agents. Let's get the evidence and use that to make the decisions. I also suggest we try again with diarrhea and other potential agents. This is worth considerable effort. There's a lot to be gained by controlling invasive pines in the Western Cape. I would also ask that we continue our work on Fusarium circinatum to fully understand its ecology and epidemiology, to quantify the actual risk to forestry and develop effective mitigation measures in this industry. What we don't try will, of course, never succeed. Thank you. Um, thank you to the National Symposium on Biological Inventions for giving me this opportunity to present. Um, I'm going to present about risk analysis of the invasive oriental fruit fly Bacteriosella invaders in South Africa. 
Bacteriosera invadans is classified under the Bacteriosera dorsalis species complex, which include Bacteriosera dorsalis, Bacteriosera papaya, and Bacteriosera philippine. However, currently Bacteriosera dorsalis and Bacteriosera invadans are classified or said to be similar species. Therefore, they, hold, they are now named under only Bacteriosera dorsalis. Bacteriosera invadans is native to Asia. And widely distributed in Sri Lanka. Globally, Bacteriosera invadans is found in Africa, Asia, and also some parts of islands in North America. However, they are also found in South Africa, mostly in Limpopo, and widely distributed in the Bembe region. They are also found in Northwest, Gauteng, Mpumalanga, and KwaZulu Natal. Bacteriosera invadans is transported from one place to another through infesting in food, lay eggs under fruit skin, and then as you can see there with a pointer, the sign of ovipositional damage through a depression on the fruit. And then they become transported through commercial trade of fruit from one place to another. That is one of the pathways of Bacteriosera invadans from one place to another. However, they can also be transported locally through commercial trade and also they can be assisted by wind to fly from one place to another only locally. Bacteriosera invadans has a major damage in the commercial foods. This is simply because they have a wide range of host plants which include grapefruit, mangoes, oranges and guavas. Moreover, larvae of this Bacteriosera invadans can also infest on fruits, causing those fruits to ripe prematurely, which has a huge damage on the economy simply because the premature ripe fruits cannot be sold or can never be sold, which leads to a major economic damage. Also, they have an, an impact on the environment simply because they displace native fruit flies from their environment. We conducted a risk analysis using the risk analysis for alien taxa framework. We found out that Bacteriosera invadans has a major consequences in the environment and also in the social economy. This is simply because they displace native, native fruit flies from their native environment and also they cause a major damage in commercial trading or commercial farming of fruits. They also have a probable likelihood simply because they can be transported from one place to another through commercial food trading, which occurs now and then or frequently. And also, they can also fly from one place to another locally. This gives us the highest risk of giving Bacteriosera invadans a species of high risk to the environment and also to the social economy. The first step to manage Bacteriosera invadans is to use civilians, which is carried out by using traps such as the Maxfield, Camperpet Bucket, the Morocco, and the Lakefield trap. Methyl, Janol, and Biolo is used as bait specific for Bacteriosera invadans, and this civilian is carried out in major towns, point of entry such as borders, ports, and airports. However, this same Methyl, Janol, and traps can also be used to trap Bacteriosera invadans within the commercial fruits areas or the, the where uh, commercial fruit farming occurs. The other method to manage Bacteriosera invadans is through protein baiting that should be carried out weekly in food production areas. The first step is aerial baiting, which is used through spraying using combination of protein hydrolyzide in combination with malation UL and also ground, bait, ground baiting that should be applied on host trees. This should be done in fruit production areas. The other method to control Bacteriosera invadans is biological control using the baraconide wasp, which is said to be one of the successful biocontrol agents for Bacteriosera invadans. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks to the presenters. Um, we have a couple of questions, um, which will take us now into the discussions um, session for the next um, the next fifteen minutes or so. Um, the first question um, is for Llewellyn. I'll, I'll go in order of the presenters. Um, so Llewellyn, I see there's two questions for you. Um, the first one is how much coordination exists between inside and outside sand parks with regards to managing invaders, especially along rivers? Hi, Ryan. Um, at a sand parks level, it, it's quite difficult. Ideal is of course to integrate across the landscape um, with the neighbors, um, but it varies really widely. Um, at a more local level at Kruger, for example, we're part of things like the Incomati Water Catchment Association, where all the stakeholders are um, involved. And also in Kruger to Canyons uh, program, biosphere program, to try and align some of the projects that, um, that are running in the park and outside, for example, in Parthenium. So some of them work, but there's obviously a, a lot more integration needed. Great, thanks. thanks. Um, the next question is, um, where is the data gathered from and how is info gathered to support the number of alien species within, within the parks? Most, most, most parks have been keeping species records for quite some time, but in around 2010, we had a fairly extensive project where all park managers, rangers, and um, ecologists were contacted and asked for any information that they had on species. And then over time, we've just been like, updating these as, as we've been alerted by either people in the park or even just visitors to the park. So we're just trying to keep that, that database live um, and keep adding to it. Great, thanks, Luan. Um, I see there's one more question for you. Um, has the reduced income from tourism affected invasive species work or was the invasive species um, project ring-fenced? I suppose they mean in terms of budget. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the loss of revenue caused through um, the lack of tourists coming in has a, had a huge financial impact. Uh, the activities that we can do um, are limited a bit more. A lot of the work is done through the Working for Water program. Um, so obviously funds there are, are constrained, but um, many of the projects are able uh, to continue. But th there's definitely going to be some, some effect. I think. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm just going to move on to our next questions. Are there's a few for uh, Norway too? Um, the first one. You're quite popular today, Norway too. <laughs> um, all right. Um, the first one is: What is the 2021? I know you've answered this online, but just for for everybody, um, what is the 2021 extent of the Spartina population? 17 um, to 2018. So the area that was occupied by Spatina, it was about 0 0.5 hectares. So we haven't been um, um, monitoring the estuary for the past um, two years because the mouth um, has been closed. So that's where we are standing at the moment. Um, so it should be like um, 0 0.5 or even less um, 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 in 2021. Right, that's really good to know. Huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. The next question is uh, from, from David Lemaitre. Um, will this species remain on the watch list or will it be completely delisted when, um, when, when the estuary remains free of new plants? Yeah, so uh, I think it should remain on the watch list. Um, um, it, it's not clear. Um, we don't even know when we can declare this species as eradicated, first of all. So I think it's best that it remains there um, in, the, in, in the watch list. 
Yeah, I think it should remain in the watch list. I, I don't know until when. So we're just going to keep on monitoring the estuary for many more years. Um, I don't know till when, because it's, it's really not clear um, when to declare species as eradicated. Thanks, Noeti. Um, and then I know this question, it hasn't got um, your name on, but I think Debbie was referring to you. Um, she um, posed a question, has any soil tests been done for AMPA residues? Mm, I'm not sure. I don't know what that acronym mean, um, but we didn't do any soil tests or um, or any residuals of the herbicide. But what we did check though um, is the uh, you know the, the mortality of the you know the the, the animals and the plants um, in the estuary, and then we didn't observe any mortalities after um, um, we applied um, after we uh, we applied we fully uh, sprayed the, the the plants. Thanks very much, Noeta. I think that covers about all your questions. Thank you. Um, Next on the list is Relay. Um, Relay, your question is, why is water lettuce sprayed when there is such an effective biocontrol agent? And good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are doing integrated control. You hear me? Can you hear me? Just, I can't hear this myself. Um, we use we do integrated control. So there's areas where we have po pockets where we do biological control releases in the pockets, which is deep. The spraying is done where the water is flowing. So that's where, where the teams is uh, spraying mutually. Um, Any more questions for me? Thanks, Rale. Um, I think no, we, we covered for now. Thank, Thank you. you. There's a couple for um, Zuki. Um, you have one. Why is the why are the large variants in triclopyr costs? Good afternoon. Thanks, Ryan. Um, since the data was collected over a number of years, in some years people would use less of that particular herbicide, and in some years it would be one of the most used herbicides. And I think that's um, because of availability of the herbicide in that particular year. And sometimes the selection of herbicides is due to um, personal preferences. And I would like to emphasize that we need to do away with personal preferences and stick to the policies. Sometimes when a person realizes that herbicide X, for example, is very efficient in the field. They'll tend to use that same herbicide over and over again, not realizing that they um, putting themselves at risk of the, heavy, the invasive species developing resistance. So we need to do more of adaptive management in our approaches for herbicide usage. Thank you. Thanks, Yuki. Thanks for answering that. Um, the next question is for Debbie. Um, which herbicide is currently being used against submerged aquatic weeds in South Africa? Um, the one that's registered in South Africa at the moment is diquat dibromide, but the department has decided not to use diquat dibromide. And the reason for that is, as I've explained it in the presentation, that the, the human health risks and the, the risks that are to the environment, the environmental fate is too high. Um, so we've taken the precautionary principle with regards to the hierarchy of control, and we've decided not to use that. So we basically just doing the monitoring and surveillance um, for the submerged at the moment. And we doing the biological control with some of the species for the submerged that are currently available. But we're also looking into uh, two new mode of action submerged species pesticides that we're doing trials with at the moment. 
Um, one of them is endothel, and the other one I cannot mention at the moment because it's a new mode of action, which we're busy trialing with the pesticide companies. So the one is diquat, but um, we've taken the, the, the decision due to precautionary principles not to use diquat. So though that's the one that's available, but we're going to be looking at endothel as soon as we can get the emergency registration paperwork through. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. Um, and the next question is for um, for Yafta. Um, and um, Yafta, your question is: As neither chemical or biocontrol deal with every individual, perhaps getting the beetles to move to parthenium plants that escape the chemical application will improve the overall or overall success. Have field trials been tried to test this? Um, afternoon, everyone. We haven't done anything in the field to test this, but we are still doing this in the lab and we are using the level recommended concentration. So to answer the question, I would say, even if we were not targeting certain individuals, but we are trying to reason, in, to reason it at a larger scale. If people are spraying in the field, obviously they will be spraying at a larger scale. So insects sometimes cannot travel for longer distances. If sometimes you'll find that some don't even fly. So we are trying to target that kind of a situation in the field. So it's a situation kind of a field that we're trying to predict. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Philip Ivey for um, Andrew. Um, Andrew, the question is, I think the research questions you propose need to be addressed, but more importantly, I think there is a need to get wide support from both plantation industry and other stakeholders for this research. How do we get the plantation industry on side to address these questions? Thanks. Um, a good question, Philip, but uh, we've been waiting for the, the forestry people to, to provide support and that hasn't really happened. So I think we have to do it the other way around. We've got to get the evidence first to convince them that the risk or the effects are low. Um, and if the effect or risk aren't low, then it isn't a good idea and we need to find another, another agent. Um, but I think it would be beneficial for the, the forestry industry anyway to have this research done because whether or not um, the biocontrol agent introduces uh, fine pitch canker um, or not, there, there may well be another agent that does that. So any research that improves their management in terms of disease outbreaks would be good. So I think we've got to work from the point of view of getting the evidence first and then making the decisions and not just um, making decisions based on some uh, vague perception of or fear of, of risk. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and then I've just got a question for for um, Zuki. It, it, it's something that we, you know, discussed in our in our regional management. Um, Zuki, why do you think the in in some years there seems to be a, in your earlier years there was quite a lot of use of um, herbicide, and then um, tailoring off in our recent years there seems to be less use of herbicide from your presentation. Thanks for the question, Ryan. I think the differences in the use of herbicides, especially in the past 10 years, with it being lower than uh, from 2006, 2010, might be due to an increase in the integrated approaches where people tend to use uh, different control methods like integrating with uh, biocontrol and also with the increase in the mass rearing um, institutes, and that might have also increased the production of insects. So there's more insects available for people to use and be less reliant on herbicides alone. Thank you. Great, thanks, Suki. Yeah, I think the mass rearing control agents has helped a lot in. I mean, especially in our daily operations, just to reduce the amount of herbicides, especially in inaccessible areas and, and that type of thing. So, so thanks for that. Do you thank the presenters once again? Um,
Sorry, thanks. I would just like to thank the presenters once again for, for everything. Um, it's really valuable to see see what is going what is happening on the ground and um, yeah and there's some really good work happening whether it be from a research angle to to eradicating certain species to to just reducing the impact of certain species um, so keep up all the great work um, the um, what um, what's going to happen now is we're just going to break for tea for um, ten minutes from um, twenty five to five to quarter to five. And then, um, like I said in the beginning, it'll be the workshop, um, which is on indicators used to monitor biological invasions at a national level. And you can just stay with, stay on this session to, to attend the workshop. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>